And again, welcome to today's webinar. And today's topic is turning your land to a sponge or management of pastures, pastures following drought. Today's presenter is Dr. Larry Redman with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service. And um, this webinar is made possible by Trinity Waters, Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service, but also in partnership with the Forestry and Natural Webinars series. This is an effort that's put on by Bob Barton, Bill Hubbard, and myself, Eric Taylor, now with Texas A&M Forest Service. So um, I hope we have a great success today. And without any further, I'm just going to pass it over to Dr. Larry Redman. Larry. All right, actually, this is uh, Blake Aldridge with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service. Uh, just I'm the webinar coordinator and wanted to uh, just briefly kind of talk about our project. We're focused on uh, land stewardship and water conservation in the Middle Trinity River Basin and um, always trying to look for new ways to get good information out to our landowners. And so this is actually the second in uh, a series of three webinars that we're conducting. Uh, and you can go back to the Forestry Webinar Portal and look for the first one, which is uh, called Trini uh, Treasuring the Trinity Challenges and Opportunities. And it's archived, and you can watch that. And we'll also have our final webinar on September 12th. And that'll, that one's titled Meeting the Water Needs for Texans and Wildlife. And so I also want to make you aware of a uh, Trinity, our Trinity River Land and Water Summit, which will be October 2nd at the Kane Center in Athens. And we'll be sending out a news release through AgriLife Today uh, very soon, talking more about that. Um, but you know, a lot of our focus is on water quality, uh, watershed management, and land stewardship in general for the benefit of landowners. And so, with that, I will pass it off to Dr. Larry Redman, who is the state forage specialist with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service, to talk about managing pastures following drought. Well, howdy from College Station. Glad to be with you today. Hope everybody's got a good sack lunch. I do not. So I hope I don't give out due to hunger here later. But we are going to talk a little bit about the management of pastures following drought. And for many of us uh, in Texas, Oklahoma, um, some other parts of Louisiana, Arkansas, New Mexico, we are, we are still in a drought, uh, have been in a drought for many, many years. And so we're going to discuss some of those issues as we uh, discuss drought and pasture management. So we'll start here with uh, a look at the U.S. Drought Monitor map that um, was actually issued September 20 of 2011 when we were uh, involved in, in what's been characterized as the worst drought uh, in Texas history. And so we've got records that go back to about 19, I mean 1885, and since we've been keeping records, we've not seen anything that was as devastating as this drought during 2011. And so for many uh, parts of the state, uh, they are still in that same exceptional drought category. So if we look at uh, last week's download, and you can see that there's some pockets of those uh, exceptional drought areas still remaining in Texas. In fact, if you look at that uh, right-hand circle there on, on the chart, uh, you can see that a, a little over 5.5% of the state is under what's characterized as exceptional drought. But I think maybe more critical is uh, this left-hand circle there, where we can see that 88% of the state is currently under drought, some sort of a drought, either you know moderate to severe to extreme to exceptional. And then if we look at uh, the USDA long-term uh, forecast, and you can see through October 31 there, uh, much of the state, in fact, East Texas earlier uh, forecast had shown that um, much of East Texas would be drought free, but we can see that that drought is going to redevelop. Currently in this part of Oklahoma, uh, they are currently drought free, but they are forecast to have drought develop back into that area. And so the forecast does not look that good for us. 
in fact, our climatologists will tell us that these cycles are uh, fairly predictable. They're fairly repetitive. And if you look at the cycle, they're usually 22 to 25 years in duration. The current cycle started in about 1995. So if it's 25 years in duration, we're looking at uh, another several years before this uh, this current dry cycle comes to an end. And uh, this past week, uh, or earlier this week, we had beef cattle short course here in uh, College Station. And we had climatologists that was here telling us the same thing, that we can expect several more years of dry conditions uh, here in the state. So when we talk about drought and its effect on, on forages, and then of course we can extrapolate that to other issues that we'll talk about a little later in the presentation. But uh, you know we know how drought affects forages and plants don't grow. But the problem there is if we have that reduced above ground growth, then we have reduced root development. And this is what's so devastating for pastures is that as we lose the ability to produce roots, those plants can neither look deeper for nutrients or look deeper for soil moisture. And so there's a negative feedback on that so that then we have even more reduced above ground growth. And that eventually gets us into dormancy or death. Now, warm season perennial grasses are fairly drought tolerant. And if you have, I don't know what a typical dry cycle might be, but if you have a, a short-term dry cycle, uh, most of the time these grasses will simply go dormant. But during the drought of 2011, we lost a lot of grass, whether exotics or native grasses. Uh, and we even lost a lot of brush species and tree species here in the state. So tremendous drought, tremendous uh, effect of that 2011 drought, and we're still experiencing a lot of those same issues. It's really about the root systems uh, on these grass plants. And the drought can affect uh, root growth, certainly overutilization of, of the plants from grazing that doesn't uh, leave the, the level of residue or photosynthetic material in the pasture that's necessary for the plant to, to photosynthesize and grow the roots uh, that can then feed back to the top and have more top growth. But it's all about the root system. And the root systems in many of our pastures have just simply been devastated uh, due to not only the drought in 2011, but the continued drought that we're experiencing uh, here in the state. So if we just look at species one here, and we look up here and see this is what the root system in a, uh, a plant that would be under normal, uh, better growing conditions, and then contrast that with the same plant under drought conditions. And you can see what happens to the, the root system there. And so again, it, it's all about the roots and trying to get the roots uh, reestablished so those plants can feed themselves, have more top growth, uh, more potential for photosynthetic uh, activity, which then leads to more root growth. So let's, uh, let's assume for a moment that we're going to talk about pasture recovery. And if we talk about pasture recovery, then uh, it starts with water. That's a no-brainer. Everybody knows if we don't have the water, then we can't end uh, a dry cycle. We can't uh, have any potential for these plants to recover, uh, start to re recover, and uh, uh, rebuild production levels in those pastures. And so uh, this is a site that we haven't seen in a long time. I tell people that certainly if you have some mailbox money coming in from that oil well right there, that's certainly helpful. But most of us are just waiting on the water. So water aside, we'll talk about uh, some other aspects uh, necessary for recovery. And the first one we'll talk about is fertilizer. And this is, this is uh, an issue that, you know, since back in the, the 40s, I guess uh, right after World War II, uh, there's been a lot of uh, inorganic fertilizer used in pasture systems and uh, introduced or exotic grass systems. And, Primarily, the one that we're uh, going to talk about here would be Bermuda grass. Bermuda grass is uh, widely adapted to most of the soils and soil types, the climatic uh, conditions you'll find across the southeastern United States. And the thing about Bermuda grass is it was selected for response to fertilizer. 
And if we don't fertilize Bermuda grass, it doesn't stay with us uh, very well. It starts to thin. It starts to open up. Uh, other things start to move into its place, and then you know we look out there and we've got a weakened stand of Bermuda grass with something else that's occupying uh, that area. And sometimes those plants that move in might be desirable. Sometimes they're not. Uh, many times we characterize those plants as weeds, and then we have another problem then uh, trying to deal with uh, increased weed infestation. But it's kind of interesting if we look back at the history of Bermuda grass. The first uh, hybrid Bermuda grass was released in 1943 by Dr. Glenn Burton at the Coastal Plains Experiment Station, Tifton, Georgia. And so if you look at Dr. Burton's work uh, in 1943 releasing coastal Bermuda grass, and then you also look at what was happening there, World War II, uh, we had built up a tremendous amount, uh, a lot of stockpiles of ammonium nitrate for explosives. And then in 1945, the war came to an end. So now we have a hybrid Bermuda grass that loves fertilizer, and we have an abundance, overabundance, of very, very inexpensive ammonium nitrate. You know, if you were looking to just grow grass and, and produce as many pounds of red meat per acre as you possibly uh, could, it was one of those decisions that was pretty easy to make. Get you some coastal Bermuda grass, call the fertilizer distributor, get them to come out and load you up. But things have changed uh, over the past several years. And so if we're going to keep Bermuda grass, we have to learn to fertilize and fertilize it well. And you know, I show this picture uh, checking the oil with a dipstick. And I want to remind people that when we're talking about uh, fertilizer application, it should only be made uh, with the soil test recommendation. If we don't use soil test recommendation as the basis of our fertilizer uh, application, we're probably wasting money on some very, very expensive nutrients now. So checking uh, the dipstick there, we're looking at two things. We're looking, number one, for uh, the quantity of oil in the crankcase. So the dipstick tells us, number one, do we have a sufficient quantity of oil in the crankcase? And number two, if I don't have a sufficient quantity, then the dipstick simply tells me how much I need to apply. So when we're thinking in terms of soil tests, think in terms of the soil test simply being the dipstick for your pasture. So um, we know how much nitrogen we need. We don't need a soil test for nitrogen for hay harvest or grazing or whatever uh, because it's a very mobile nutrient, doesn't hang around. And so you know, if we know about where you are, we can make a recommendation for nitrogen. But we simply cannot make a recommendation for phosphorus or potassium, uh, possibly uh, sulfur if you need that, or some magnesium. Uh, we can't tell you anything about the soil pH. These are all critical aspects to produce Bermuda grass, produce uh, the optimum quantities of Bermuda grass. But it means that we need to be using soil uh, test as the uh, the method, or the I guess the what tells us how much fertilizer to be putting out there in the pasture, and so. We do that typically. It's going to be in August, September, October. Sometime uh, in that time frame, we'll, we'll get our soil test each year, for, uh, especially for the hay meadows. Critical service in hay meadows. We're mining nutrients, so we need to make sure that we're replenishing the nutrients that we remove. And you can use different uh, things to test with. I mean, very, most common is a sharpshooter shovel. Uh, easy to get a, a sample with that. Always use a clean plastic bucket. Uh, don't use a metal bucket that can confound the test. And then certainly some uh, probes or augers, something like that, uh, or additional uh, you know, things that we can use to obtain a good soil test. Critical thing about fertilizing Bermuda grass is not only does it give us the response in yield, the response in crude protein, but it also makes those plants a lot more water use efficient. So if you look at this, for example, and this is Bermuda grass, so if we use uh, no uh, fertilizer at all, it takes almost 18 inches of water to produce a ton of Bermuda grass. But if we get up to about 100 pounds of uh, N that we apply per hay harvest, you see that we can actually reduce that dependency or that need for water from 18 inches down to about 10 inches. So uh, fertilizer on Bermuda grass uh, 
plant has a lot of benefits and, and really helps that plant not only to be very vigorous, um, it helps to exclude weed uh, infestation, gives us a higher level of crude protein, and again also helps us to be more drought tolerant, uh, be more water use efficient so we can get the yield sometimes with less water uh, compared to uh, non-fertilized Bermuda grass. What we tell people, uh, at least here in Texas, is that after a drought, as you're coming out of a drought, those plants obviously need some nutrients, but they don't need the same level of nutrients that they would require if you had uh, you know, good growing conditions. So let's say that I've got a, a devastated hay field, and I used, I'm used to getting three harvests, two tons per acre uh, per harvest, and that's what I would typically put on my soil test report form when I send that in. Um, that that field's not ready to get the level of, of nutrients that the lab's going to recommend for that. So at least in Texas, what we recommend is there's a little box over here on the submittal form. It's called minimum requirement. And we think that minimum requirement is the box that needs to be checked. Because what that tells the laboratory then is that you have a new establishment. And that new establishment then will require less fertilizer. So they're going to turn around and make a much lower fertilizer recommendation. They will still, it'll be based on the soil test and what levels of, of phosphorus, what levels of potassium, what the soil pH is. But you will not receive this, this huge recommendation for fertilizer nutrients when that plant uh, can't utilize. It doesn't have the root system to take up that level of nutrients. And so, at least in Texas, we'd recommend that you use that soil test submittal form and uh, check that minimum requirement box until that field has had uh, enough time, good growing conditions, moisture, so that it sort of heals up and hairs over, if you will. All right, so then the third aspect, we've got water, we've got fertilizer. The third aspect that we're going to talk about is going to be protection. And these forages, and, and this doesn't just apply to uh, plants coming out of drought stress. This can apply to plants under any kind of growing condition. And so we're going to talk a little bit about protection. And the first uh, aspect of protection I guess we'll talk about is protection from weeds. Because if you've got heavy weed pressure, and we'll look at this, this fence line contrast. And so uh, here's a, a place on the left-hand side. And they obviously have a tremendous weed infestation, tremendous weed canopy there. So then we start looking at photosynthesis. And I think everybody's probably you know, aware or familiar with the concept of photosynthesis. It takes solar uh, radiation, solar energy, combine that with carbon dioxide in the plant. And that plant's able to produce a carbohydrate that uses for energy source for respiration. All right, so it takes sunlight. And if you look at this picture on the left hand, or this field, left side of the fence, um, there's not a lot of sunlight getting down to the grass plant. So whether it's a plant that's coming out of uh, winter dormancy, coming out of drought stress, or just a plant that's out there under good growing conditions, simply cannot uh, do the photosynthesis that it ordinarily could have uh, or should have with that kind of a weed canopy on top. Think of that weed canopy as just simply an umbrella that's capturing the sunlight and very little sunlight getting down to the grass plant. So under these conditions, especially drought uh, conditions, the grass plant has almost zero potential for recovery because it's not getting sunlight, so it's not able to photosynthesize. And also under limited moisture conditions, those weed plants are uh, getting most of the moisture and transpiring that moisture out of the soil so that the grass plant, again, is going to suffer. So we need to think in terms of protecting that, that grass plant recovering or otherwise from this uh, weed canopy. Same thing can be said uh, for winter pasture. Uh, we have a lot of people that plant winter pasture, and it depends on where you are and what your goals are. But it could be a legume, it could be ryegrass, it could be some sort of a small grain uh, that's planted each winter or each fall for winter and spring grazing. Uh, the situation there is that if we don't manage if we don't manage that winter pasture, then it becomes a weed in the spring. And so we've got uh, the same situation where we'd have a, a tremendous canopy of winter pasture on top that's getting the sunlight, 
and getting the moisture, getting the nutrients. And if we don't if we don't take care of that, if we don't manage that properly, then you can wind up with a situation that's represented by this photo on the right hand side there. Uh, this was a field over in Smith County, uh, Texas, outside of Tyler. Uh, that is a, uh, a long-standing coastal Bermuda grass field. And if you look at that, this is in June. We'd had a dry spring. The, the landowner had not managed his winter pasture properly. Had a tremendous crop out there that basically killed most of the Bermuda grass in that field because that's that's what you have in June if you uh, don't manage that winter pasture right. So I tell people that winter pasture needs to be managed. It ought to be grazed off because we're going to plant that again so we don't worry too much about overutilization of the plant. But we need to graze that off or in some situations bale it. And we need to look at nighttime temperatures as sort of a, a gauge, if you will, uh, sort of a, a trigger that as we start seeing winter uh, nighttime temperatures, early spring uh, nighttime temperatures start to approach 60 degrees, that tells us that warm season grass is fixed to start making some pretty active growth. And we need to have that winter pasture removed before those nighttime temperatures get consistently 60 degrees and above because that's when that grass is going to be needing and looking for sunlight and moisture. We need to protect our pastures from grasshoppers. Uh, we have a lot of grasshopper uh, issues right now, and we've had a lot of grasshopper issues for the past decade or longer. Grasshopper pressure seems to be heavier uh, during dry years. Uh, my understanding is that maybe some of the predatory uh, diseases that might could impact grasshopper populations uh, are more prevalent during the wet years. We've got better growing uh, conditions. Uh, for those diseases, but under really dry conditions, we have a lot of grasshopper uh, hopper problems. So we've got different uh, treatments there. I mean, we can use something called Demolin. Uh, it was first labeled for use in rangeland, uh, but then later it was uh, that label was extended or expanded to include uh, introduced or exotic forages. The problem with Demolin. Uh, if there's a problem, is it has to be applied to young hoppers, and so you got it's a growth regulator. So you got to give them on these little hoppers before they start going through these different instar stages and and molting and going through these uh, various growth cycles. So you have to get them on young hoppers. It it can have a little bit of residual, which is a good thing because we like to be able to get hoppers for longer than just one day. Doesn't have much in the way of uh, grazing or hay restrictions, but again, you got to get them on those young hoppers. So then people look uh, to more traditional, if you will, maybe Malathion and 7XLR. Now the nice thing about this combination mix there is we're only using four ounces of each product in a tank mix. Uh, typically, Malathion would be recommended to you at a quart to the acre. 7XLR, some of the other seven products, a quart to the acre. But we can get darn good control on grasshoppers uh, with four ounces of each in a tank mix. Now, it's effective and it's fairly cost effective, but there are some caveats. Uh, one is it's 14 days before you can get back in the field. And so for some people, uh, that's sort of a, a non-starter. And you can only, because of the seven, you can only use it twice a year. And so that could be also uh, a problem for some people because a lot of times we'll treat these grasshoppers, we'll get good kill in the field, but then maybe the neighbors didn't treat, and so grasshoppers move back in, or they just come in naturally from some other locations. We've got some different other products, uh, Mustang, Tombstone, Lambda Psi. Some of these things are pyrethroids. They are synthetic pyrethrins, and uh, they're, they're effective. They don't have uh, much in the way of restrictions, uh, if any and they're fairly inexpensive to use. Uh, so all of these work very well, but the one I want to bring to your attention today is uh, a new one uh, called Prevathon by DuPont. And the thing about Prevathon is uh, two things. Uh, one, it's safe, and, and the other, it's effective with long residual. So when I talk about safe, and we start looking at pesticides, and pesticides in general uh, typically all have one of three signal words. One of those signal words might be the lowest level of signal words would be caution. Uh, the next one up would be uh, warning. And the final signal word 
would be danger. And so uh, some of our you know, insecticides uh, can be fairly toxic to humans. The thing about Prevathon is it's the first pesticide that I've ever heard of that contains absolutely no signal word because it is that safe uh, to humans. So uh, the thing about Prevathon also, besides being safe, is it is uh, it has good residual uh, activity. I'll show you a little bit of data in a minute. But you know, when you start talking about uh, protection from grasshoppers, it's kind of interesting to note that grasshoppers can eat a lot of grass. If you've got seven or eight grasshoppers per square meter in a 10 acre field, it's just like having another cow out there. That bottom one is even more significant. If you have an infestation level of 10 hoppers per meter, uh, per square meter, they can eat up to 60% of the available forage. Our hopper infestations for the last several years have been 30 to 50 hoppers per square meter. And that level of infestation, the grasshoppers can consume every blade of grass in the pasture. And I've seen that. I've had so many people tell me that. Uh, you can go into the pasture and look around, and there's nothing but stems left because the grasshoppers will absolutely eat every bit of every blade of grass. So when you think about photosynthesis again, if we have no green photosynthetic material out there, no tissue, then again, those plants are not able to photosynthesize, and root development suffers. Everything about the plant suffers. So grasshoppers can be devastating. We need to protect uh, against them. And so here's some data uh, that shows the Prevathon. This is a 10-ounce rate of Prevathon up here. Uh, this is four weeks after application. You can see virtually zero grasshoppers. The 14-ounce rate, we have zero grasshoppers at four weeks after. And you compare that to some of the more popular uh, uh, the Bathroy, the Mustang Max, some of these other things. Uh, we've still got quite a bit of, of grasshopper pressure out there in the pasture. And so when we start looking at uh, control, a lot of times we'll treat and uh, our neighbors do not. And so if I treat and then uh, my neighbor does not, then I still get protection. I can still get some really good protection for four weeks in our uh, Entomologist at Corpus Christi, uh, Dr. Roy Parker, has uh, had some plots out where they've actually seen uh, some pretty significant impact even eight weeks after application. So uh, a safe product, a, a product that is very effective. Uh, now, the product does not kill on contact. Uh, the product stops the, the uh, insect from eating immediately. So when you spray and use Prevathon, You'll still see uh, insects uh, moving around for two or three days, but they are not doing any damage. The damage has uh, been stopped immediately. They don't consume any more tissue, and they eventually starve to death, and that's the mode of action on Prevathon. Interestingly enough, uh, Prevathon was first offered as a fall armyworm control uh, product, and it does an outstanding job on these worms. Uh, we only uh, found out later that it had great activity on grasshoppers. And so a lot of the same products over here can be used for fall armyworm uh, you know, control. But again, when you spray these products, they kill the day that you spray, but tomorrow uh, there's not any residuals. So again, Prevathon, I think, has a lot uh, going for it. It's, it may be a little bit more expensive. It's probably on a... 10 ounce ray, it may cost you $12 an acre, but you're going to see uh, long term residual, so you're not going to have to spray near as many times uh, to keep the, the either fall army, army worm or the grasshopper under control. So you might, might want to check on that. And finally, uh, we need to think about protection from livestock. And so, you know, 2011 should have taught uh, a lot of people a lot of lessons, but you know, here's a, here's a picture uh, from a guy that was uh, in Brazos County. And you can look on the ground here, and he has absolutely no forage whatsoever. The only thing green out there, slightly green, uh, are goat weeds. And so cattle are basically not going to consume those unless you hold a gun to their head. But this guy still has cattle. He still has cattle, cattle, cattle. And so... The question then becomes, why does he still have these commercial cows? Because feeding them was costing him so much money at this time because we didn't have hay. They were buying hay from out of state. Uh, 
uh, you know, it's costing at least a hundred dollars a month to feed these animals, and that is just not economically viable uh, under any circumstance. So let's talk a little bit about a tale of two philosophies. Uh, we're going to talk about grazing philosophies uh, in this situation. And so here's another producer, different guy, and yeah, rough looking pasture, like Dr. Kathy says here. It's a rough looking pasture. Again, the only thing green here are weeds. There's not any grass, and yet this guy still got tremendous numbers of cattle on these pastures. Everything that they're getting to eat is either coming out of these trees where they can reach or out of a hay bale. And again, those hay bales were costing anywhere from 100 to $180 each. And a 1,200-pound uh, a cow is going to require about a six-foot round bale per month. So you can see the economics on that. Cattle could not possibly live long enough to pay back the feed bill uh, incurred during this one devastating year. And yet we continue to be under drought conditions, and people continue to have cows where they probably shouldn't have cows. A lot of people that are a little more savvy uh, about these things, they actually moved cattle to different counties, different states, where there was pasture available. And the pasture rental rate at that time was somewhere around $22 per pair per month, which is a huge difference between paying $100 and $150 a month uh, to feed those cows standing out in the pasture. Now, I took this picture of this property. It was about two to three miles down the road, same side of the highway, same day. So if you compare that to the picture that we just looked at, so look at that picture, then look at that picture, look back at this picture, there's an obvious difference in this guy's grazing philosophy. Number one, he's got grass in the pasture. Now, he might have just put those cows in there, but he at least had grass somewhere to put those cows on. The grass, in this case, is Bermuda grass, and it still has some green, even under a tremendous level of drought stress, which tells me he has fertilized that grass. You also look in that picture, and you don't see any weeds, and so he's managing his weeds. So this guy has a totally different philosophy about how to manage his cattle and what his sort of grazing philosophy ought to be or could be. Now, one of the things that this sort of leads to, this, this uh, dichotomy, if you will, of grazing philosophies, is we look at some data that uh, our range science uh, faculty put together a few years ago. What they did is they went out and they looked in the pasture in January, and they clipped, and they determined how much forage residue uh, was remaining in the pasture on, I think it was on the 1st of January. And so just look at this this one fellow here. He's got 100 pounds of dry matter per acre, which is not very much forage. It looks like some of those rough pastures that we looked at a while ago. And in this situation, during the growing season, he, re he received right at 17 inches of rainfall. So he produced about 1,800 pounds of total forage that year. All right, so get get the picture here in your mind. Bare, bare pasture, a lot of bare ground uh, showing up, 17 inches of rain, 1,800 pounds of forage dry matter produced. Now, different situation. This fellow had 1,500 pounds of dry matter remaining in his pasture on January 1. So there's a big difference right there you can see in their, their grazing philosophies. This guy over here on the left, used up everything that he was able to produce that year. He let his cattle graze up everything. The guy on the uh, right over here wasn't, didn't have that kind of mindset. He was stocked a lot lighter. He left a lot more forage in the pasture. And in fact, he only received 57% of the rainfall that this guy over here received on the left. And so when you look at that, and, and he, he got uh, a little less than 10 inches of rain, he produced almost 4,000 pounds of dry matter. So then the question becomes, it's kind of like a riddle, it's how do you produce twice as much forage with almost half, half the water? And of course, this is where making your, your property a sponge comes into play. Because if we leave forage in the pasture, we may have less rainfall but we're going to be able to capture the rainfall that falls on our property. I work with a colleague, I can't remember who it is now, 
but I heard him say one time that he did not want to share a drop of rain with his neighbor. And so I asked the question, you know, is this guy being stingy or is he being a good land steward? And I submit to you he's being a good land steward because water is so precious and it's so vital for, for our forage production that when I get water, I want to be able to capture all that I have. I don't want it going down into the creek and then into a reservoir and eventually into the Gulf of Mexico. I want to capture my water and use it on my piece of property. So it's, it's critically important to keep residue, keep grass in the pasture, and the way we do that is we pay attention to our stocking rate and we spend time out in the pasture and take a look and see what's going on out there. You know, you, you always hear people talking about uh, rainfall and rain gauges, and it's always likening it to people being in a uh, coffee shop talking about the great rainfall event that they had last night. And so one guy says, yeah, I emptied three inches out of my gauge. The other guy said, yeah, I did too. But if you have the two individuals that have two different grazing philosophies, one guy might have truly got an effective three-inch rain because he got to keep most of that rain on his property because he had grass in the pasture. The other guy, if he only had 100 pounds of dry matter uh, in January and he was grazing up everything that was being produced, when he got three inches of rain, he did not get the effect of three-inch rainfall because most of that rain went off his site and down the creek and, and into a reservoir and then into the Gulf of Mexico. So when we sort of start looking at all of that, putting all of that together, then we finally get down to protecting this soil resource because without grass uh, in the pasture, there's a lot of negative things start to happen. And so if we have bare ground, a lot of bare ground out there, then we start getting rainfall. Besides losing the water, besides having the water move off of the site, then we have these other negative things happen because when you look at uh, a raindrop impact there, we don't think much about that, but there's a tremendous amount of energy tied up in that little tiny raindrop. And in fact, when it hits bare soil, it can sort of uh, blow up like a little bomb and it can scatter soil particles up to three feet away. So everybody has seen a crust, like on this right hand side here, everybody has seen bare ground and seen a crust on top. And that crust is formed when we have no residue protecting that soil because as that little raindrop impacts the bare soil, it takes larger particles and breaks them down into smaller particles. Those smaller particles then seal the surface, like over here on the right. And so suddenly we have a much harder time getting moisture into the soil profile. And now it starts to run off. And as it runs off, it takes with it topsoil. And you know, we can, I think we can all agree that topsoil is a critically important component to growing grass or any other crop. But it takes, it can take up to a thousand years or longer to create one inch of topsoil. And if you think in terms of, you know, how long did it take for us to, to create that topsoil and then how quickly can we lose some of that? So here we are with bare ground and we get a three inch event, rainfall event, we could easily lose an eighth, maybe a quarter of an inch of topsoil. Well, there just went, what, up to 250 years of topsoil development just with one rainfall event. In fact, if you look at this picture here where we've got these plants that have formed a pedestal, uh, you can see that the, the distance here is about 12 inches. And so this particular site may have experienced up to 12,000 years of topsoil loss from that particular site. So now we're getting down to where only thing that's showing there might be the sea horizon and this is not going to be beneficial for growing crops. In fact, as you look around here, you can see on all this eroded site, there's not a lot of grass production taking place on that site. So once we allow this to happen, we'll never uh, recover from that. Not in, in our lifetime, children's lifetime, grandchildren's life, doesn't matter how far you want to go into the future, will not recover the productivity uh, of this site uh, in the foreseeable future. So besides losing the water, 
that you vi just vitally need, uh, especially during drought, besides losing topsoil that could have taken you know hundreds to a thousand years to create, we also have other things that are going down the creek. We've got fertilizer nutrients that we may have applied in a Bermuda grass field, and we might have had just enough water to melt those prills and get that, those nutrients to move in that top quarter inch or so of soil and hadn't moved down yet. And then we get a big rainfall event, lose topsoil, lose fertilizer nutrients, lose organic matter, which is critical for water holding capacity, nutrient holding or nutrient storing capacity. We lose that. And we lose any pesticides that we might have had uh, a chance to apply to the, the property out there. So all this stuff is going to go down the creek because we don't have adequate forage residue in the pasture. So you look at a situation like this, of course this is a crop field, but you can see that when we have a lot of bare ground, there's a lot of water, a lot of soil. Everything is leaving the pasture and it's going down into the creek somewhere. And then finally, uh, one of the things that's really become uh, critically important, in, not only in our state, but every state in the nation, is this issue of bacteria. Um, everyone is familiar with EPA and the uh, Clean Water Act. And we start thinking about EPA, Clean Water Act, those kinds of things. Uh, we have state agencies that act on behalf of EPA that go around and measure, monitor, uh, and sample different water bodies in the state of Texas. And the law requires, Clean Water Act re requires that uh, every two years the state has to submit a report to EPA showing uh, how many water bodies, uh, which water bodies uh, that have been sampled, how many of those met the quality standard for that particular water body, and how many of them failed, and what did the ones that failed, what, what did they fail for? What was the cause of their, uh, their failure? And so if you look at this particular map here, you can see that uh, bacteria is a huge, huge reason for impairment in the state of Texas. And in fact, if you look at the latest report that went to EPA, the 2012 report, uh, just a little over 1,200 water bodies were sampled in the state of Texas. Uh, a little over 600 of them failed, and over half of them failed due to bacteria. So, you know, bacteria can come from a lot of different sources. Uh, it can be an off-spec water treatment, uh, wastewater treatment facility. Uh, it can be a septic system that has uh, a little bit of problems uh, leaking into the water. Uh, it could be feral hogs. It could be white-tailed deer. It could be a bunch of ducks on a pond during the winter. A lot of sources of bacteria. But in the rural community, many times the finger is pointed at livestock producers. And certainly cattle can and do contribute to the problem. Uh, we've got enough data where we can identify the bacteria uh, DNA to determine, OK, what kind of animal did this come from? And we know that cattle are a problem maybe 18, 20% of the time. But because cattlemen are sort of a loose organization of independent agents, many times the finger is pointed at the cattle producers in uh, rural communities. And the blame is sort of generally laid at their feet. And they're told that they need to clean that up. Now, typically, initially, this is all voluntary. It can become regulatory. And so when you look at issues like water loss, topsoil loss, uh, organic matter, nutrients, pesticides, and bacteria loss from a site, all of those issues can be uh, negated, reduced tremendously by just simply keeping water or keeping grass in the pasture so that you don't have water leaving the property. If you can capture water on your property because you've got the right stocking rate, the right kind of grazing management, the right level of forage residue left in your pasture all the time, then you can reduce uh, all of these issues, you can uh, you can stay out of uh, some sort of regulatory issue uh, if one ever was to come to your part of the world. And believe me, if you've not heard of a TMDL coming to a watershed near you, 
there will be one soon because if you're in this part of Texas, if you're in the eastern half of Texas, uh, this is where most of the water impairments are located because that's where most of the creeks are. You don't have too many creeks out here in the trans Pecos. So most of the issues are over here in East Texas. And so if you live in that part of the state, you probably already have heard about a total maximum daily load implementation plan or you soon will because uh, EPA is, uh, is pretty darn serious about this. All right, so briefly, if you've been uh, terribly impacted by the drought, a lot of people are asking questions about reestablishment. And so let's talk a little bit about that. I think the first thing people have to do is ask themselves some serious questions about their operation. Uh, are you still interested in producing livestock? And uh, there's a lot of people that are asking themselves that question. Uh, and some people have answered that question and said, no, uh, I guess I'm not anymore. You know, it might be uh, their age. They might have gotten to a point that they had to destock and they're thinking, yeah, I just don't know if that's what I want to do uh, anymore. Uh, some people may have a desire to change enterprises. And so uh, are you going to go from cattle to sheep or goats, hair sheep in the meat goat industry is a growing industry? What about hay? As high as hay was selling, there's been a, uh, a lot of interest in people getting some irrigation systems put together so that they can grow hay during the drought, and they can sell that hay at, uh, at a higher price than they normally would. And then there's a lot of interest in transitioning into wildlife management. If you're not aware, uh, you can get the same 1D1 open space lands tax valuation appraisal method on your property. Uh, managing wildlife as you can in traditional agriculture, that is raising cattle or, or raising hay or something like that. So uh, at least in my thinking, I think that uh, there's a lot of benefits to moving to wildlife management and using wildlife as agriculture because I think there's a lot more flexibility there. Some of you may have run into some of these uh, issues uh, over the drought uh, years, the last several years where you just need to get rid of all your cattle. That may have been a problem for your chief appraiser in the county. Uh, he may have come along and said, I can't count cows. I don't see cows on your property. Therefore, you're, you're fixing to lose your uh, ability to be taxed at a lower rate versus market value. If you're in wildlife as agriculture, uh, you can have cattle or not. It uh, doesn't matter. But you're no longer basically under the rules of the chief appraiser, you're under the rules of Texas Parks and Wildlife. And there's seven qualifying practices. Uh, there's Within those seven, you have to do three a year. Uh, I'm not going to say that it's just real as easy as putting up a corn feeder and shooting at coats, but there's a lot of things that you can do with Parks and Wildlife to help manage your property, get that lower tax uh, appraisal method and use cattle only as you need to. I like using yearlings uh, with wildlife programs because if it's really, really dry and I don't have a lot of grass I need to manage, then I'm not going to own any cattle this year. If I have lots of grass during the growing season, I can load up with uh, yearlings, control that grass, and at the end of the growing season, they're going to town, going somewhere else, and I don't have to feed cattle uh, during the winter. And finally, another question a lot of people have is, you know, is there a uh, desire to change the forage base? And I think uh, there's been a lot of interest in returning to native forages from a wildlife standpoint. Also, economics of cattle production. You can you won't have as many cattle, but the cattle you produce will cost you less than if you have fertilized Bermuda grass. There's been a number of people who've looked at that, and it's just very difficult to put a pencil to and come out uh, on the positive side of the ledger with fertilized Bermuda grass and commercial cow-calf production. Back to reestablishment, we need to assess, OK, we're going to stay in grass. We're going to stay with uh, whatever we've got. So how bad was the damage? So if the damage was bad to a coastal Bermuda grass field, you're probably going to have to go in there and replant, because coastal has a, a notorious reputation for being slow to spread. On the other hand, if you have something like Jigs or Alicia or Tifton 85, they spread very rapidly. At the Uvalde Station, they've documented stolen growth on Tifton 85 of almost five inches per day. And so 
if you've got a lot of damage to a Tifton 85 field, but there's a few plants scattered around, chances are that can fill in and recover in one growing season if you get water and you fertilize it. Uh, and what about potential for recovery? You may have some grass that's been badly damaged. It needs t time to uh, heal up, produce a new root system, and, and start filling in and covering the property. But have you adjusted that stocking rate? Or have people that you're working with, have they reduced their stocking rate so the grass even has a chance uh, to recover? And so a lot of questions to be asked. And so when we look at sort of a conceptual deal, if, if profit is tracking along with cost, then I don't really care what nitrogen fertilizer costs, essentially. Because if nitrogen is 75 cents a pound today, if I'm getting $1,500 for my calf, commercial calf that I sell down at the sale barn at weaning, I don't really care what the, uh, the nitrogen fertilizer is costing. But what we've got is a situation like this where a profit or sales have been going up, but maybe not as rapidly as our costs. And this is where a lot of producers find themselves today with fertilized Bermuda grass. Uh, calf prices are good. They've been really good uh, for quite a while now. They're probably going to be good for the foreseeable future, just because of the reduced number of cattle that we have. But these prices, especially on fertilizer, just continue to escalate because of global competition for these finite nutrients uh, that we use as fertilizers. And when you look at who's buying fertilizer, I mean, it used to be the, the U.S. It was the, the big fertilizer market, but the Chinese, people from India, uh, Brazilians, all these uh, different nations now are starting to buy a lot of fertilizer, and that puts upward pressure on fertilizer prices. So. We've got a lot of people that are interested in maybe changing that forage base, as we discussed earlier. And when we talk about changing forage bases, again, it depends on what your goals are. Uh, if you're interested in still being in cattle, uh, necessarily, not necessarily cutting a lot of hay, although you can cut any of these for hay as long as you fertilize. I wouldn't cut hay off of natives. But any of these others will respond. But a lot of places that these things are grown, we don't get enough moisture. But you know, if you're in the, the Brazos Valley east to the Atlantic seaboard, the hay grass does an excellent job for grazing cattle. You can cut hay off it, like I say, but for grazing, it does an excellent job. Klein grass, where it gets uh, drier as we go further west uh, of the Brazos Valley, uh, Klein grass is an excellent cattle only forage, not for horses, sheep, or goats but it does an excellent job for grazing cattle and growing animal performance is actually better on Klein grass than it is on coastal Bermuda grass. Uh, WW Beet All, Old World Blue Stem. Excellent uh, Old World Blue Stem, not nearly as invasive as something like KR. Uh, makes more forage. Uh, it's later to maturity. If you're down on the uh, coast, uh, Gordo Blue Stem has been used for years and years and years. Buffalo grass on the sandy soils in deep south Texas. And again, the natives. And there's a tremendous interest in native prairie restoration in a lot of places in Texas, uh, basically from a wildlife standpoint. So if you're thinking about transitioning to alternative forages, uh, just realize that you'll have a reduced stocking rate. But uh, chances are the profit's going to be higher. You can still maintain the 1D1, Schedule F, lifestyle, all those things. Plus, if you go with natives, you're going to be enhancing uh, the habitat for uh, wildlife species. So what's it going to cost to establish? If you go back with Tifton 85, it may cost you $150 an acre. If you go with uh, coastal, about 60 Some of these seeded type Bermuda grasses, if you go with common, it's going to be $50, maybe a little less per acre. Some of the, the better uh, seeded varieties that have the potential to produce more than common, uh, something like giant or cowboy is going to be about 90 bucks an acre. Klein grass, uh, about $32 an acre. We have a gentleman here in this part of the world that actually has all the money in the world. And uh, he was planting a lot of Bermuda grass, but since 2008, they have really slowed down on their Bermuda grass. And they're planting everything to Klein grass now for their cattle operation, or much of it is going to Klein grass because he doesn't have to fertilize it. 
and cattle performance is good. And same thing about the overall blue stem, about $40 uh, per acre. Show you a little bit here about uh, what I was saying a while ago about putting a pencil to it. And if you just look at the, these two columns right here, native versus Bermuda grass, you get down to the bottom line here. And it's hard to make money in the cattle business. We all know that. But you can lose a whole lot less using natives. Or you can lose a whole lot less using something like Klein grass or one of the, you know, Old World Blue Stem, Bahia grass, those kinds of things. Um, that's because of the $50 an acre fertilizer charge and also because of the additional annual variable cow cost. What that is is, you know, it takes about $550 a year to own a cow. And if you have more cows on the Bermuda grass side, then it's going to cost you a whole lot more money. Uh, to own those cattle on that side. So uh, bottom line there is it's hard to make money with the Bermuda grass. If you lower that to $40 an acre on uh, fertilizer, you still are losing a tremendous amount of, uh, of money there. And this is with cattle selling, the calves selling for $650 a piece, which is, which is a pretty good price. If you increase this to 1000 this would obviously change this. But I don't know many people that are getting a thousand for cell barn cattle. Uh, colleagues at Oklahoma State uh, put together some information, a paper that they presented uh, a couple of three years ago, and you can see that basically they had native versus improved. Uh, improved in this case was Bermuda grass and tall fescue, and you can see that again you lost money uh, on the the native side, but not nearly as much is what you would lose over here on this uh, introduced forage Bermuda grass with fertility. So in summary, it's going to take three things for these pastures to recover. It's going to be moisture. In the case of Bermuda grass, it's going to take fertility. And then we're going to need to think about protection, not only as we recover from drought, but also think about protection just Anyway, it's just uh, the typical uh, part of your management strategy. Just think about protection of these forages. Uh, think about the, using the right stocking rate so that these plants have adequate forage residue in the pasture so that they can photosynthesize, uh, develop those roots uh, and top growth that they need to. Need to protect from weeds. Typically, it's cheaper to spray than it is to mow. Mowing does not manage weeds. It just knocks the top off for a while. But if we are in drought conditions, mowing may be the only uh, course of action until we get better growing conditions. Protect from winter pasture. Uh, tell people to introduce forages. Or if you have a uh, native and you want to set aside a little bit, uh, piece of farm ground that you can farm warm season and cool season annuals, uh, that's great. Use all the winter pasture that you need. But if it's in your pasture with your warm season grass, be sure and get rid of it. Graze it off, bale it. Uh, before we start getting into those 60 degree nights. Protect that pasture from insects. Got some great products out there. The, the newest of those would be Prevathon from DuPont. And think about protecting the soil, protecting the, the water from uh, topsoil, bacteria, pesticides, uh, organic matter, nutrients, all those things. Uh, and we can do all of that just by using the right stocking rate leaving of grass, adequate grass in the pasture. And I think with that, I'm, I'm through. And so what do we do from here? Dr. Taylor or Blake, what do we need to do next? Well, now's the time to see if we have any questions coming in. Um, so this right. is the time, everybody, if you want to type in your question there in the chat box, we'll certainly get to that. Looks to me like Dr. Cassie's the only one doing any typing. He's, he's good at getting resources out there to everybody. Well, Dr. Evan, we have one from Randy. So right. Will you send us a link for the recording? And um, I'll take that one. <laughs> That'll be up to you. Yes. <laughs> That'll be up to you, Dr. That's right. The recording, uh, all of our webinars are accessed to the same portal page, and that's spores.webinars.net. And uh, you'll see a tab that says for upcoming webinars or a tab for previous webinars. And so if you click on that previous one, you'll see links not only to this recording for this webinar, but also for the one that Blake mentioned earlier about treasuring the Trinity. 
I, I got I got one from Candy uh, that was sent directly to the moderators, and she asked a while back, what is the effect on Predaton on bees? Okay, interesting that you would ask that question about the effect of Prevathon on bees because we had the same question at uh, Beef Cattle Short Course and I don't keep up with bees but the next day I got two emails from a DuPont representative that cited some studies that, uh, that they were aware of where the effect on the bees was actually, and they were talking bumblebees, so I, I can't make that leap over to honeybees necessarily, but apparently the effects were very, very minor. And so uh, they haven't done the studies with the honeybees, but they had looked at it with others, uh, with the bumblebees, and so they saw uh, some fairly minor effects on that. Uh, let's see, Susan, Susan, you know better than ask this. Is there any data available on the amount of soil moisture stored by various grass species? Susan, I don't know if there is or not, and I would think that you probably have that right there in your <laughs> office, <laughs> if the truth was known. But uh, I don't, I don't know. Jump the star, stump the star. Yeah, there you go, Kathy. I don't know. I would think that. Uh, I mean, I would just think that the deeper rooted plants would have the ability to uh, store more, and, and we're assuming similar sites because deeper rooted plants can have more uh, organic matter produced because of increased root production. We know organic matter uh, has the ability to, to attract and hold moisture in the soil, and so I would think, Susan, just kind of guessing, <laughs> Susan saying, I really don't have it. So. Uh, Anyway, but I'm thinking that the deeper rooted plants would have the ability uh, at those sites to store more moisture just because of the deeper rooting profile, more organic matter, uh, more roots down deeper provides more channels for more moisture to move into as it infiltrates and then percolates. So I'm just going to assume that. Uh, and somebody can certainly correct me on that if that's not correct. But that would be my guess. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Susan. I appreciate it. I'll send you that 20 later, OK? Do we have any more questions coming in? Now's a good time. I see that Brett is typing something. Mm -hmm. Give everybody just a minute or two to, oh, there we go. Uh, do you have an opinion on Mr. Manziel? Who is Mr. Manziel? That's a joke. I understand. Uh, no, I don't. I don't I don't follow uh, our sports teams. I mean, I got pretty excited when the, the ladies won the national title uh, and actually watched that game, but I typically don't keep up with college uh, sports. Uh, good herbicide to control goat weed. All right, Randy, here's your answer. The cheapest thing and, most, and, and as effective as anything is just simply 2,4-D. Uh, if you'll get on those... Uh, Broadleaf annuals ought to be, uh, you know, treated when they're two inches, four inches tall. If you'll do that, you can get by with only a pint of 2,4-D per acre, and 2,4-D is very, very inexpensive. So chemical cost on that may only be 250 an acre or something like that. And so uh, it, it doesn't have any residual. So if you're looking for something that may have some residual that will help keep some of that goat weed seed from germinating for the next couple of three weeks or something like that, then we've got to look at something that has some residual uh, soil activity. And that would be something like uh, surmount, graze on P plus D. Graze on next doesn't have a lot of uh, residual soil activity. You're welcome. OK, we have. At least one other typing in a question here. While we wait for that question, let me make a, a point here that we uh, we do offer. I mean, we don't have CEUs offered for this webinar. We do ask that if you take some time to fill out the satisfaction survey at the end. What I'm going to do is push a link. Well, I'm just going to type the link into the chat box and put it there. So if you will, uh, if you want to take a few minutes just to fill out that link. Of course, who forgot to put their phone on mute? That's me. All right, so Sandy's got a question there. Uh, Eric says, is there a cattle breed that would be easier on grazing to carry through the winter? Uh, when you say easier, I'm assuming that you're talking about maybe uh, 
less forage, a little more efficient uh, in their in their forage use, maybe a little lower quality. You know, they're going to all be fairly similar. The Brahmin breeds uh, have the ability to. Uh, they're a little better at recycling uh, some of the nitrogenous compounds, and so you know they can probably get by with something that's just a little bit lower. But at the same time, having said all that, uh, winter's a hard time uh, for any of those cattle, and it, it really pays dividends to make sure that you know you can have hay that's not very good, and you can still feed that as long as you know that that hay is not very good based on forage tests, and then that forage test will tell you and help you make the right supplementation decision. So um, I would I would concentrate more on the forage and the supplementation rather than trying to you know find a, a breed that might be just marginally better because marginally is going to get you in trouble. Well I think that's all the questions that we have coming in and uh, so everybody if you can use your little hand clapping emoticon and get Dr. Redman a big round of applause, virtual applause, um, or, or raise the hand, that's good. There's a hand clapping underneath a smiley face that we can all use as well. Can I give them an address to send yeah. checks to? Okay. Um, I'm, I'm going to let, uh, just hand it over to Blake to see if he has any final remarks he wants to make. All right, I'm turning it over to Blake. Thanks a lot. Very I good job. It. Thank you. All right, well, this is Blake Aldridge again. I um, appreciate everyone for uh, taking some time out, taking your lunch break. Um, to join us today. Hope you learned some, some great information and um, as we promote land stewardship for water conservation um, and just keeping keeping these things in mind. So um, once again, thank you all and uh, have a great day.